I uh, just took this job a few months ago um, with the News Integrity Initiative. It's, a, it's at the uh, CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, and um, it's basically a philanthropic fund. I'm a, my background is in philanthropy, and um, one of the nice things about being in this space is that um, I loved hearing the story about John D. Rockefeller because um, I really uh, grew up in philanthropy at the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation in New Jersey. Geraldine was uh, John D.'s niece, um, so it's really nice to be in this space. Um, I guess one of the things that I am really feeling about this conversation tonight is that um, the complexity of having a conversation like this about the media is that it's much like you said about climate, it's not, it's not a monolith, and yet we lump it together as if it's one thing, and it's not. It's many, it's, people experience it very differently, and what happens at a national level or an international level may be very different from what happens at a local level, and um, my heart is really in local, um, much like Dana, I grew up on a farm in rural Indiana, and so um, my, my heart is really in local, and, and my experience in philanthropy is working with local journalism. Uh, I, I did a lot of work in New Jersey around um, really trying to understand what, um, what sustainability looks like for local journalism, and, um, and what I learned from that is, um, is uh, I learned a couple of really interesting things about, about philanthropy itself, actually. So when you were talking about epiphanies, one of the epiphanies I've had or, or somebody helped me see in philanthropy is that um, we, philanthropy means love of mankind, right? I try to never lose perspective of that. And um, we, we rely on giving grants to nonprofits who then do work with the public, with the community. Philanthropy rarely um, actually interfaces with the public, with the community. And the epiphany I had was that nonprofits kind of act like our middlemen. <laughs> and we can't necessarily always rely on the middlemen who are coming to us for money to, to know exactly what the public wants and needs. Um, and so I funded this project. Uh, it's still ongoing. It's um, being led by a national news organization, I mean, a national organization called Free Press. And um, it's called News Voices New Jersey. They also have a version of it in North Carolina. And it's very much in sort of the community organizing model. Um, it brings newsrooms, uh, it, you know, local journalists and the public together um, to really build relationship between them, build understanding. And um, one of the things that was the most powerful for me, again, like uh, not listening just to the middleman, but going, going to these community forums that Free Press held and hearing me hearing directly from the public about how they feel about the media was, was probably the most enlightening um, experience I had in all of the funding of all the different, you know, like of all the different kinds of funding that I was doing in New Jersey because um, these, these community forums were happening all over New Jersey and without exception at every single one of them, whether it was in a more affluent community or a, a poorer community, um, everyone was, would say how angry they are at the media. And part of the problem is that um, people also lump it all together as if it's a monolith, right? And when you tease it out, they're really mostly mad at the national media in a lot of ways um, because it has the biggest megaphone. Um, but it's the same, it's the, uh, they say, without exception, we're sick of the crime and death stories. We're sick of you always telling bad, bad news about our communities, perpetuating racist stereotypes. Um, we get frustrated with reporters who parachute in and they, they misquote us and they spell our names wrong and like they just don't get anything right and they don't offer us any hope or any solutions or anything and I think actually this story is really representative right because you turn on your local TV news and what do you see all the time are mug shots like that just repeatedly and it just gets perpetuated and, and reinforced 
every single day in ways that like you don't even realize it's just there and it, it it's always like that um, and so um, a lot of the work around the news integrity initiative is um, really about trying to um, build relationships and build trust and empathy and and um, push a vision of journalism that serves as a force for building trust and empathy and solutions in communities. And it's um, long-term long-term work, long-term time-intensive, labor-intensive work. And, I, and when I talk about it, I'm talking about it from a very local level. I'm not really, I'm not personally um, focused on national media. I'm focused on smaller community media around the country right now. Um, so I wanted to, did you hand me the, what did I do with it? Oh, here it is. Um, so, so I wanted to show a couple of examples of what this looks like when it's done really well. Um, to give you some hope that there is, there are ways to do this work that um, are really lovely and powerful. Um, where, what am I pointing at? Okay, so this is, um, this is the Center for Investigative Reporting. And um, they're, they're one of my very favorite examples, actually, because um, so they do all kinds of investigative reporting. Um, but what they do differently that I don't know of any other organization doing this, they, um, they incorporate all kinds of creative um, ways to bring that story to communities to help them uh, understand the complexity of the story, but also to talk about the, uh, the impact on the community. Um, and this, in particular, is um, a poster. So they, they do a lot of theater, actually. They commission, uh, they commission original plays based on the investigative reporting they do. So this particular one is about um, pesticide use uh, on strawberry fields in California. And so in addition to sending out postcards to uh, all the communities surrounding um, sort of the ground zero for the major pesticide use in Central California so that you could um, type in your zip code and find out what the pesticide level was near your home, they also commissioned this play that fictionalized what it was like to um, live near these strawberry fields. And it was a story about a pregnant woman and sort of her struggle with, are these pesticides affecting my health and the health of my baby? And then, so not only did they do this play, um, they did it in a theater in San Francisco, they also took it out into the strawberry fields and did it in Spanish for the workers in the strawberry fields, as well as there was a nearby high school too. So they do these really interesting things that, that are deeply empathetic and really seek to um, break down the, um, the complexity of the subject and, and talk about it and put the public at the center of their work and really try to understand the, the information that people need and try to serve that. You know, our vision is really about journalism as a public service. So another example of this, and this is another favorite example. Um, for anyone who lives in, have, maybe has lived in Chicago recently, there's this um, program called, this is public radio, it's called um, Curious City. And the, um, this is like some of the most creative journalism happening in the country right now, it's Curious City. So they have this methodology where they basically say to the whole city, what are you curious about? What questions do you want answered? And, and what's, what makes them different, I mean, anybody could do that, any, any newsroom could do that, but what makes it different is there's like a public voting process for those questions and, um, the winning, the person who submits the winning question gets to go along on the reporting process and find out the answer and get to report, gets to report it out on the radio with the radio reporters. And um, this is just one particular example. They, they have, a, there are a ton of different things they've done and they do, they do things that are sort of just delightful and fun and they do some things that are very serious. And this one, again, is just an example of, this is an interactive actually, about what it's like to be homeless in Chicago during the winter, and it and it helps build empathy. It helps you bring you to really understanding what that looks like. And I have one more quick one. Sorry. So this is um, 
This is um, an, a project uh, that started in New Orleans. It's called The Listening Post. And again, it's interesting. There are a lot of them really, a lot of this comes out of public radio, actually. A lot of, a lot of uh, individuals in public radio who are just deeply empathetic and really want to test out some creative ideas sort of outside of the, um, outside of their normal day jobs. And so this is um, a project in New Orleans where they set up um, microphones in public places and invite people to uh, record their responses to uh, a question that they might see posted on a sign around town. Or um, they may say it on the radio. They may say, here's what we want you to talk about this week. But like, what's lovely about this is, I, um, is that there are, these signs are a wide range of topics. Why are you mad? What's for dinner tonight was another one. Another one was, um, why did you stay in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina? And in this way, you're really understanding what uh, people care about and what they want and need. And um, what I would say about, at least from a local level, where we can start to think about solutions to this problem is we can start to put the public more at the center of journalism and really try to understand what people want and need and what makes them so mad about the way that journalism is now and try to fix that. And it's really sort of long-term um, relationship building work, but it is a real solution that also happens to um, tie directly to the business model and the, the bottom line of of news organizations.